should do it perfectly. So I'm here with the man, the myth, the legend, number one fan, Miles Lambert. Hello. How you doing, mate? I'm grand. And this is uh, the morning after day one of our Carnage tour. Hashtag on, Carnage. On Miles and Steve's excellent adventure, <laughs> as, as we've called it. Um, and we just thought, uh, we've got a little bit of a uh, the tasting that we did with uh, Thornbridge yesterday coming up for you to listen to, where we went through uh, five beers um, with Ben from Thornbridge. I'm also joined by uh, the Owl Lady as, as well for that tasting. But we thought we'd just, um, rather than just jump straight into that, have a little bit of a chat about our, our visit to the brewery yesterday. So, what, what did you think? It was a great day, wasn't it? Oh, it was incredible. Um, obviously, Thornbridge are a brewery that you, you've, all, you've always held up in high esteem, you know. So to be treated like that by them was just it was yeah. incredible. It felt really, really exclusive really special didn't it, it was yeah unbelievable and just just to be uh i suppose to make it clear to, to to the listeners that was uh the the lot that you and i mm. won as part yeah. of last year's big last, last year's yeah yeah last year's big berry night um which was uh, a private tour of, of thornbridge tutor tasting um with with one of their brewers and also a box full of beer of, that's no longer available uh, as well so we've got some some great beers to bring home with us as as well um so yeah i mean we were what picked up at the station by yeah. by simon who's the ceo uh, at thornbridge and it was simon that sorted out the, the lot for us so firstly really grateful to, to simon and to thornbridge for putting that up for auction last year so, so simon picked us up at the station we had a nice drive through the peak district beautiful because we came into buxton didn't we yeah. and, and, and went through and and then arrived at, at the brewery and um a bit of lunch and then and then straight into the tasting wasn't it it was incredible so we've got five beers try to pick slightly different styles that we do um mango house i think everyone's quite excited about trying um, was, was that a little four, squeal of excitement there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so we'll start with Lucas. So, um, Bavarian Helles Lager. Rob the head brewer. Um, German styles are his kind of favourite thing to brew. Um, it's got a lot of complexity, but there's nothing really to hide behind. Lagers are very delicate. Um, and this one, especially for us, we want to make a a proper Helles Lager, so we're using uh, malt that we brought over from Bamberg, everything else is Simpsons, um, but for this we get malt from Germany, um, we use a Bock yeast and we use Hallertau Tradition German hops, so it's German all the way through. Um, it's fermented at 9, 10 degrees, so nice and cold, um, it takes probably 10, 11 days to ferment and then another 4, 6, 8 weeks um, lagering after that. A lot of the other beers we do, we treat and process afterwards, as in glass, stabilise them, things like that. But this, we just wanted to keep it as raw ingredients as we could, so we don't do any additions at all. Um, we do centrifuge it, um, obviously no pasteurising, no filtering, um, and it's just really delicate. It's got enough bitterness and body there to be a, a Hellas, um, and it's just... In, in terms of the, the lagering time, mm. is, is there a, a set minimum that you're aiming for? Um, eight weeks, um, but you'd probably say, I'd say if we did six weeks, that'd be all right, but we're yeah. for eight every time. Um, and we step the temperature down as well. So uh, ferment at 10, and then we'll give it a week at four, and then step it down to two a couple of weeks later, and then down to minus one a couple of weeks after that. So you're not shocking the yeast with a really fast chill from 12 down to minus one. So it's kind of that stage chilling, mm -hmm. which the yeast likes a little bit more, and also helps with the lagering. Um, but yeah, it's it stays on there four weeks lagering time, but I suppose it's kind of eight weeks beginning to end, and then we've had some in the tank that we've had for nine weeks, we've had some at five weeks, and we've started to notice that they do taste differently. So I think the last batch we did, Rob's kind of decided to try and extend the lagering time even yeah, so for us, it was, we're still um, trying new things with it in terms of the lagering time, getting the freshest tradition hops we can, trying them all, um, 
yeah. How, how does that compare to like the traditional styles from, from Germany? Is, is it about the same sort of time that they lager for as well? Um, yeah, I think it varies from brewery to brewery, but generally, yeah, four to eight weeks would be what they'd go for. Some even longer, some shorter. Depends on depends on the brewery very much. Mm. Um, a lot of people, I know there's been some studies out and things that say that lagering doesn't actually do anything. Um, Rob's keen to bring that one up when we talk about it. He says, oh, I've got this paper that says two weeks. You can't tell any taste difference between two weeks and ten weeks. And you go, bollocks. Give <laughs> 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 me a show around my health and then give me one another one for two weeks. You can tell the difference. I'm yeah. enjoying this. That's lovely. Yeah. Very nice. You can imagine a uh, cold pint of that yeah. on a oh, really hot day. Can't, can't really it. crisp cutting through it. Yeah. Mm. It's soft as well, you know. Mm. It's, it's cool. Yeah. Quite a lot of the beers we can... Um, brew, we'll, we'll dry hop them a lot and then we can leave them for a while and then process them whereas Lucas is a daily little task of taking the bottom off because the bottom of the jackets aren't properly cooled so you always get a little bit of um, beer and yeast at the bottom of the tank that's actually warmer than you want it so he's taking that off every single day making sure that that warm bit doesn't start giving off off flavours things like that um, so it is a very labour intensive beer, um, more so than the others which are very labour intensive mm -hmm. <laughs> So You've got it lagering for eight weeks. Is that taking up other space of, yeah. of, of, of other beers? Yeah, so yeah certainly. Well, that must have quite an seven impact days. on yeah. the, the throughput of beers that you can produce while you're producing this as well. Definitely, yeah. Look, we've got the tank capacity at the minute that we can store probably three double tanks worth of Lucas at any one time. Um, but, yeah, if we were doing cask beer, we could have done eight brews in the same amount of time we do one brew of Lucas. Mm. So, it's, yeah, I think if you're short on tank space, it, it could be a big problem, but we're, we're all right for that. No, it's like anything, making cask beer is easy. Making good cask beer is difficult. Yeah. It's, you know, making lagers easy, making good lagers more difficult. Yes, yeah, so this is Raindrops and Roses. Um, so every year we do a homebrew competition uh, with Waitrose Brew UK, I think. Um, and loads of people send their homebrew beers into us, sit down, try them all, pick the one they like the most, and then get them down to brew it here on the 50 Hect Brew Kit, bottle it, and sell it in Waitrose from. So this year was Phil Sisson, I think that's how he said it. Um, so it's a Belgian bit with coriander, chamomile, and rose petal. Um, it's probably one of my favourite beers we do the minute um, it's just so nice to drink it's so soft and there's so many different flavors in it as well um, the bit yeast um, comes through a lot so this one that when we're processing it usually we take out all the yeast and we're packaging um, because we don't pasteurize or sterile filter if there's any residual sugars left in the beer the yeast in there could bottle condition and carbonate up more than we want so we'd usually try and take out all the yeast Whereas this one, the, the bit yeast is so important in the character of the beer um, that we centrifuged half of it and then transferred the rest on top just to lower the yeast count down to an acceptable level so that you don't get floaters in it or anything like that. But you still, there's still plenty of yeast in there giving you that mouthfeel. A lot of people taste different, different things. So you get a load of that chamomile at the end, don't you? So no. I think it smells quite rosy and then there's lots mm. of chamomile at the end where chamomile has been described as like it sucking really a sponge. Is. Well, I don't like um, chamomile tea because it tastes like freshly mown grass, not what I eat that on a regular basis. <laughs> but this is... <laughs> craft that's brewing. delicious. Yeah. So it's a really nice balance between the coriander there, the chamomile, the rose petal, and you can kind of pick all of them out. Um, and then the, the bit of yeast in there as well gives it such a really nice mouthfeel. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of that. Uh, not a fan of the rose or the caramel or just the whole. Uh, just everything. That's in everything there, about yeah. it. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of whipped beers anyway. Uh -huh. So it's, a, it's, it's not didn't get off on a good start <laughs> really. Um, but then yeah, all the other uh, bits in it's just uh, takes it a bit too far away mm. from beer for me. I like that because it's it's it kind of takes on a journey. Uh, yeah, Kipling. So, 5-2 um, Pale Ale with Nelson Sovan. Um, probably one of the earlier beers we did. 
and I think out of these five, it's the only one you can get on cask as well as bottle and keg. Um, so there's only a couple of our beers that do kind of broach the cask, bottle, and keg all together. Um, there's certain styles that we don't want to do on cask, and certain styles we don't want to do on bottle and keg. Whereas Kipling, I think, is great in both. So one of the great things about that is when Nelson Sovan as a hop is really good, Kipling tastes fantastic. Mm -hmm. If you get a crop beer when Nelson Sovan isn't so good, then unfortunately the whole beer is yeah. just not quite as good as it yeah. was. So it's the, one of the ones that in a pub I'll regularly get a guy at the bar thinking, well, what have you done to that Kipling? Not a shade on the beer it was two years ago. I'm, like, oh, I'm really sorry about that. But <laughs> you're, you're so reliant on that, on that yeah. hop in this beer. Yeah, but it's, single, it's the risk you got with single hop beers. Mm -hmm. um, and do you not know that until it's at the finished product stage that the hop's yeah. not been so good? No. Um, a lot of the times, I think last year, we, had, we started adding about 50% more Nelson to get a similar character mm -hmm. as we did from the year before. Um, and yeah, it's when you taste it and go, oh, that's different to what I remember and then looking at the hops we smell them all and, and check them all before every brew uh, but some years they're just not as good and uh, we had a bit of crossover in crop years so we've saved a bit so we can try and blend kind of old crop new crop together um, but then you'll never to be fine that the new crop is just way nicer so you'd much prefer to do is just use a hundred percent new crop and make a, a much better one um, whereas a lot of the other beers if one hop comes in it's not so good you can tweak the hop bill to get the same overall beer but using slightly different combos whereas something like this it's not really got anywhere to hide. It's also one of the ones we actually have to restrict brewing of because quite a lot of other beers have Nelson in it mm -hmm. and if we brew lots and lots of Kipling it basically drains our entire supply of Nelson because we don't get that much of it um, from New Zealand they don't make that much mm -hmm. we don't contract that much so things like no no still fair enough. I think they've got the lock on on the Nelson Sovan in the UK. Yeah. Like simply they've got Galaxy. So everyone's trying to get their own hop that they control distribution on. Um, but it's, it's just nice, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. That's delicious. Mm. It's doing it, isn't it? It's yeah. So is it a, a year's date on your bottle? Yeah. We. So every, every bottled one we do, we'll take some bottles back and we'll take them up in the lab upstairs, which we'll have time I'll show you later on. Um, we'll do tastings after we've been in an incubator at 30 degrees for a week. And then we also put them on a shelf for three months and six months. And then take them off, put them in the fridge and try them and fill it out with the paperwork. So essentially we're, we're testing that shelf life. Um, we send them away to people to do kind of um, forced haze analysis on them a lot of beers on bright on packaging will be bright mm -hmm. and then further down the line can kind of develop a haze yeah. um, so we're doing tests on that to try and live up to that year best before day I don't think anyone would claim that the beer is as good a year after mm. it's packaged mm -hmm. it's just the fact of a, a beer that's not it's, it's only centrifuge it's still there's still a lot in there when we package it and it's only going one way after packaging day just trying to extend and it as long as possible and you've got no control over how it's looked after once how it it's transported it is, how it's stored whether it's in someone's window mm -hmm. in sunlight yeah. or you know yeah the other two pick up so well it's more likely yeah that helps massively yeah. yeah yeah so it's, it's it's probably the main factor for us is, is that we know we've got a year on it and oxygen is the main thing mm -hmm. that's going to make it not as good as it was um, so that's just key get it as low as possible um, a lot of um, a lot of people do it's like slight bottle conditioning to scavenge a bit of oxygen mm. so that works as well um, but I think we're happy that we can get them low enough that we don't need to do that we don't want the downside so some of that is if you don't have a homogenous product in tank you'll get some bottles with more yeast than others mm -hmm. and then when that yeast in that bottle dies after six nine months or being in the window and you get autolysis and then the yeast starts throwing up off flavors so we've started by trying to put it in there 
to reduce your oxygen, but then you end up giving off different off flavours. Yeah, it has its own problems as well. Yeah, it all does. It's just a big compromise. The whole thing from beginning to end is compromising on one thing or the other. Yeah, so Kipling uh, is 100% pale malt. So you want that really straw colour, we want the Nelson to come through. AMPMs, more kind of a, a balance between more malt and hops. So there's uh, wheat malt, Munich malt, crystal malt in this to give a bit of a malty backbone. But then there's also Nelson, Citra, Amarillo, really big punchy hops in there to balance it. Um, for this one especially, getting the, the balance between sweetness, bitterness, malt flavour, hop flavour is uh, one of the difficulties of making this because obviously a beer with just pale malt and loads of hops, it tastes loads of hops, brilliant. You start to bring malt in there. If you take any of those things too far, sweetness, bitterness, hop flavour, then it just tastes wrong. People, you can tell straight away when you drink it that it's just something off. And it's just chloringly bitter or, or, or sweet or anything like that. So a beer like this, it's trying to get that, for us, the perfect balance of all four of them. So it's just drinkable and nice, and you can pick out all the bits. So, what's the um, with, with a session IPA for you? What's what's the goal? Is it essentially to get the same feel and bitterness as, as one of the bigger IPAs, but just at a lower ABV, or is it just a generally all round easier drinker? I I personally hate the phrase session IPA. <laughs> yeah. To me, it's like, oh, it's how many of these can I drink before using that bucket? <laughs> that's, what, that's what a session means, you know what I'm mean? like. So I don't really like that term. I think it was originally an all-day IPA until Phil Fowler says, no, oh, you can't really? have an all-day IPA. Yeah. Nice one, yeah. Yeah. What, you mean they didn't take to Twitter and try and do yeah. it in public? Oh, Photographs of the letters oh. and things. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of emails, we said, got yeah. this many labels. Yes, yeah, so it's grown up, aren't they? Yeah, wow. It's nice when breweries can do that. It is, isn't it? Yeah. So it's, yeah, lower ABV, but hopefully it's it's kind of weird to say, oh, yeah, I wanted to do a lower ABV one, but with more flavour. And the obvious thing is, well, why don't they all just have more flavour? Like, why isn't everything an IPA? And that's, well, well, certain pale ales have got things about them, whereas an IPA, you probably get a bit more assertive bitterness and more hop character. So hopefully in this, whilst we're balancing them all, we want the predominant of them to be hops so we want hop forward pale ale and IPA um, but at 4.5% you'll generally find one of the reasons people make hoppier beers stronger is that in the balance between sweetness and bitterness alcohol is sweet mm -hmm. so if you've got a 7.5% 8% beer if the bitterness is low it'll just taste sweet because alcohol is sweet so you can put more and more hops in, which traditionally would mean you're getting more aroma, more hop flavour. But if you didn't have the high ABV, it would then be too bitter. So you can get more things in by having them stronger. So one of this is having it at a lower ABV means you've got to be careful with your bitterness because you take it too far, put too many hops in, then suddenly it's unbalanced again. So I think the fact that it's a 4.5 IPA is that you've not got as much alcohol sweetness and residual sugar and things there balance it all off um, but it's, it's got a bit of Munich malt wheat and crystal for colour but it's a, just a nice colour mm. yes yeah, so we're, we're aiming for balance and drinkability mm -hmm. but other times you can aim for outrageous beers that really the kind of talking points and points that you try that beer of one thing and yeah it's outrageously hot for chilies or it's outrageously bitter or it's outrageously yeah. it, those ones if you if that's what you're designed to make and that's what comes out the other end of the brewery then that's brilliant um for this one we're not trying to be outrageous and unbalanced it's meant to be a beer you can just enjoy drinking taste nice I, I totally agree on the point about session ipas i think it's yeah. a, it is a daft phrase it's almost like a challenge mm -hmm. it's not necessary at all i don't i mean i think if you put IPA, I don't know whether people previously thought, oh, an IPA, that's strong. I think everyone's intelligent enough to look at an ABV and go, I know it's four and a half. Yeah, people understand what an ABV means, don't they, generally? Yeah, but who? But, but actually, I mean, four and a half percent, if you go back 15 years, that would, that would seem like it's high. It's strong. And, and it is still considered strong by a lot of mm -hmm. drink, drinkers mm -hmm. as well. But I'd, 
friend that owns a pub and he would, he would say if he puts anything on above five percent they won't drink it yeah because they they consider it to be too strong i've, I've heard that yeah. as well yeah unless it's christmas then everything goes yeah to you'd have to think it's a strong beer that's four and a half percent mm-hmm. i went to a timmy taylor's event about two weeks ago and they refer to landlord as the strong one really 4.3 wow and then they were saying another one, oh yeah, the new one's like 4-2 or something. And they were like, oh, a lot of people went after it was 4-2, two, too strong for them. I was like, what? Okay. Do you ever see this day when mm-hmm. yeah. They're going to have a session on, no. <laughs> 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 what would you say? <laughs> <laughs> well, I call it a, a daytime beer, because yeah. I very rarely drink during the day. Very, very rarely. Mm-hmm. And if I do, I won't go for something stronger than this, probably. Um, because... It, it just wipe me out for the rest of the day. I don't mean I'll be leveled on the floor or anything like that, but you just get a little bit of sleep. Yeah, they're, they're just they're just kind of more sensible ideas, really, aren't they? That's all it is. Yeah. yeah. It's if you want, if you're after that sort of IPA hit, then that you've got something on lower ABV, so you can maybe drink for just a little bit longer, yeah. rather than in your session. <laughs> in your session, rather than rather than hitting the seven point fours yeah. at the beginning. Yeah, so uh, mango alcyon. This scares me. <laughs> so Why? Not the ABV, I mean the mango. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit funny about fruity beers, but I'm alright. So from uh, trying it before, I get a lot of mango aroma, and then but it still tastes of like halcyon to me. Um, it is essentially all the same hopping as halcyon. Um, so we brewed it as halcyon, but we just fermented it with mont yeast instead of cal ale. Because um, we know when we're putting this fruit in, it's going to throw a haze. And we didn't want three, four months down the line to try and get a bright beer, which would then drop out and we've just got mango sludge in the bottom of it and it's been messy. So we decided, right, we'll try and go for not bright at all. Keep as much of that mango in there as possible. Um, and aim for that. So again, we've centrifuged a little bit of it. So we basically centrifuged the tank bottoms. So which pretty much broke the centrifuge because it was just thick hop and mango yeah. coming out. The drain was just bright orange. Um, but once you've taken that out and then you're down to essentially the, the good beer above it in the tank, we just transferred that on top of the centrifuge stuff to try and keep as much in there as possible. And again, this hasn't been stabilized or fined or anything like that because there's never been no processing done to it so it's pretty much the raw product you would get it's um it's certainly got the bitterness mm-hmm. in in there um the juice isn't overpowering or the, or the fruit flavor mm-hmm. isn't overpowering it's very very subtle within it it's just something that's not connecting for, for me i don't know i don't know what it is though so it was it was actually brewed with very low bitterness because a lot of the fruit beers of these kind of in the past the bitterness completely overpowers it and you wouldn't generally have bitter fruit it was generally quite sweet yeah. so it was actually had no bittering hop in it whatsoever um, and then on the analysis we do it was coming out at 25 BUs um, but obviously it tastes like about 60 mm-hmm. um, so the mango I don't know what it is about the mango but the mango has added a bitterness in there as well um, so it has I think if we had put bittering hop in there it would have been outrageously bitter and totally ruined it um, but for me it's I know Rob and everyone else in we didn't want to make a beer that was just mango juice no because we could make a beer that's just mango juice but then I might as well drink mango juice yeah <laughs> it's yeah. 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 We, we want we want beer we want halcyon with yeah. a mango twang to it and yeah I think, that's I, I think it's it's very pronounced mangoes un, unmistakably mangoes I think also a lot of fruits have apart from tasting of that fruit they have a lot of other things so like blueberries or kiwi fruits or something like that a lot of fruits have distinct either bitterness or sweetness or sourness as well um, so I think mango is one of those ones that should be sweeter. I think we've probably discovered that it's actually more bitter than we would actually think mm-hmm. when we're putting that much in. Um, but probably think looking forward if you could then balance that mango with something like pineapple or something like that and make a, a tropical halcyon or something like that with a few different fruits. You almost restrict yourself by saying mango halcyon because then you're going, 
well, I'm looking for mango. I don't know what mangoes <laughs> taste yeah. like because I had a bottle of mangoes yeah. with my lunch yesterday, yeah. and that's mangoes. If um, you just describe it as fruit calcium. Well, yeah. is it Sierra Nevada? I've got tropical torpedo. Yeah. yeah. Um, which gives you, I think, a bit of breathing room in terms of recipe mm-hmm. and design to get something that you like without being tied to mangoes. But I love that. I had a bottle of it the other day, and it disappeared very quickly. And then the second one disappeared very quickly <laughs> as well. I'm going to ask a really stupid question uh, that I don't know the answer. When, if you're adding heat to beer, so mangoes are quite dense, uh, thick fruit, aren't they? They're heavy. So if you were playing around with other fruits, for example, like you said, blueberries, light and fluffy and bouncy, um, or juicy oranges or something like that, does that, does the sort of texture and the structure of the fruit affect the way you brew them? Uh, Yeah, it will depend at what point you add the fruit to the beer so you can add it in multiple stages you can add it during the boil you can add it at the end of boil you can add it uh, during fermentation you can add it after fermentation you can add it at cold stage so different fruits people probably think more people are experienced with brewing is adding coffee so if you make a coffee porter and you want to add actual coffee you can add cold coffee or you can add it hot side and it's the same with fruits you choose where to add it depending on the fruit you're using so when we've done um, ones with orange peel we'll put them in hot side after the boil and you pick up loads of orange flavor the mangoes we added cold side but then because um, we added them cold side and most of the fermentation we've done we had the crowds in the beer with more yeast to ferment out the mango the sugars that we added when putting the mangoes in so after that first fermentation we then got another fermentation to try and use the mango sugars up so yeah the, the type of fruit you put in would dictate where you put it in and, and how you use it. So you could, it could be a scenario where you do one with orange, mangoes and something and you add them all at different stages. Um, the problem with that being if you don't put enough in of one of the earlier stages, you can't go back and yeah. add more. So you can find different ways to get them in. You can add orange later on if you want. But I think orange peel obviously is very bitter um, and things like that. So you want to put them in at a stage that will minimise the bits you don't want from the fruit or maximise the bits you do. Um, yeah, so I think it depends on the fruit. We, we don't really put loads of fruit in beers. <laughs> we do the, the strawberry blonde, which we add um, strawberries to the tank, cold side, the same as this. Um, but in terms of putting loads of fruits, it's probably only last year, two years, when people have just started seriously just putting loads of fruit in mm-hmm. to make the beer taste like fruit. In the past, you added hops that tasted a little bit like that fruit, and you yeah. picked up that way. Now it's like, oh, I want the beer to taste of um, gooseberries. But instead of putting Nelson soap on it, and you just put gooseberries in. But like, it's it's a different type of beer using fruit to get a flavour instead of using hops to get a flavour. I personally prefer using hops yeah. Yeah. to is get a flavour. Is that because that's the way that the market's gone, or is some of that was some of that driven by this the hop shortage that we heard so much about? I, I, I know, I, you know, everybody talks about it. But it's been it, a hop shortage for the last <laughs> eight years. There's always going to be, oh, there'll be no hops next year. Like, yeah. contract now for this mm. this inflated price because there won't be any next year well, and you'll lose out. Was that just a brilliant sales pitch? Was that well, <laughs> I think it, I say there's no hop shortage. For, the, for us, there's no hop shortage because we're contracted three years in advance. I think if you're trying to buy certain hops <coughs> on the spot market tomorrow, you'll struggle because so many people have got them contracted up. But that's... That's not to say there aren't other hops available that you can use. Um, and also, there's, there's lots of different places to get hops from. But I think moving to these, I, I don't know why people now are more inclined to want to drink beer with mango juice mm. in it than they are to have one that just tastes of mangoes that's got hops in. I'd, I'd prefer the latter. Yeah. Just, you know, brew, brew it using the hops that are going to get the, the flavours rather than adding stuff to it to, to, to give it those flavours. It, it cycles though, isn't it? You know, yeah. it, it will go back that way. I hope so. Yeah. Quickly. Not <laughs> making a thousand <laughs> BU beers anymore, are they? So yeah. It's like the bitterness rush when everyone was like, oh, the most bitter. It's now it's like the Grand Polita hop rush. Mm-hmm. Like, how much hops can you get in? Mm-hmm. Like, it just, it, it'll just ebb and flow and there'll be different styles. Um, and the, the fruit IPA... I guess it's one that the people that haven't drunk pints of mild or anything like that 
then a fruit IPA is very accessible because there's a lot of flavours in there that you're already used to. Yeah. And you've got that mango already there that you're familiar with and then you can explore the other part of the beer. You get rid of that and people are then going straight into more traditional beers. There's a, there's a time and a place for all of them. Some yeah. people yeah. don't want to drink a pint of mild. The Belgian version, yeah, a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. Was, was that popular as, as, as well? <laughs> Not as popular as this. <laughs> Not as popular. Right. That was we had Belgian yeast, and, and we I think we did a 300 batch in the yeast broth. We had it sat in case it was really nice, and then did a big one. Um, I don't think it was like. I don't know. It sold out instantly. I think it took a while to get through. Yeah. Um, but then. Belgian beers, like we found, we did a beer de garde, and we've done lots of <coughs> other European styles of beers, and they just don't seem to sell that well, or they didn't last year or the year before. I think it's uh, probably a lot easier to sell mango halcyon than it is to it's sell a beer de garde. It's the accessibility, isn't it? You know, people yeah. say, "Oh yeah, I like mango juice, I'll buy that." Yeah, yeah it's they can relate to it. But the beer de garde was amazing; uh -huh. it's a phenomenal beer. But it was like sat around for a while. It's why about is it, it leaking off the shelves and why is it having that book yeah. Yeah. when they yeah. see yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Well a lot of people will go, I don't know what beer de garde is. Yeah. Yeah. And there's nine other keg lines, three of which they know they like, and yeah. three of others they might experiment and then there's a beer de garde on the end and it's like the two second decision. Mm. No, yeah. no, 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 yes, maybe that one. I'll try them too. I'll have this one. Yeah. You know, so and it's seven point four as well if you're not quite sure of the style. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Right. Appreciate awesome. your time. Thank it's you very much. Incredible. Thank you. It's all right. I'll probably see you over there in a bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to remember what all the barbs do. So then, after the tasting, um, what, what did we do next? We got back in the car, didn't we? We did. We headed up to Thornbridge Hall. Yeah. Which is another beautiful just, place. Just amazing, though. And this is like, um, so this is the guy that owns Thornbridge. It's his private residence. As, as well, they do hire it out for, for, for weddings and, uh, and things, but it's not generally open to the public. Um, and we got to go up there and have a look at the original Thornbridge Brewery yeah. as, as well, which was quite a stark contrast to, to the Riverside Brewery, don't, don't you think? Very much so. Um, and it was at that point that the sun came out, wasn't it? Yes, so it was yeah, so beautiful grounds, got, got to have a walk around the... Um, grounds in Thornbridge Hall, got to meet Flora, yep. the, um, the statue that, that appears on all of the, the Thornbridge beers, she's just not this random thing that they, <laughs> that they put on their bottles, there, there is an actual reason to, to her being there, um, and then came back down to, to the brewery and um, we got to have a little bit of a, of a look around the brewery as well, didn't yeah. we, yeah. which oh, it's just quite massive, size, isn't it? An unbelievable amount of beer being produced in that, in yeah. that place. And and we've still room to for expansion as yeah. well if they if they need to. Mm -hmm. um, Simon was saying and you know was talking us through how they've just installed a new bottling line that's more efficient that allows them to do more more, more beer and obviously they've left provision for everything to expand uh, as well. So every piece of equipment they've got, there's space to add yeah. something else to it yeah. to make it more efficient. Always thinking ahead. Yeah. And I mean that—that's just you know to, to have got to have a look, have had a look around, and I think we were quite lucky as well because we were we were in there at the same time as a public tour, <laughs> and they didn't get to go to the places that we got they to. They had yellow jackets, we had red jackets. Yeah, to that make the, the distinction. Yeah. <laughs> um, but again, that was that was part of of what what we bid for was this yeah. kind of exclusive li little tour that that we got, and um, so yeah, look around and then. As as all these things do, we we ended up in the in, in the bar at, at Thornbridge drinking incredibly good pint, quality pint of cask Jaipur, which Simon poured himself. He did, he did pour himself, <laughs> he did, and he did a great job of it as well. But it tasted it tasted just banging. Yeah. You know, it was just like I I can't remember tasting Jaipur that good. Um, I I don't know whether some of that is, you know, that whole do you get wrapped up in a moment and does that moment have an effect on what you're tasting and, and the way beer feels at the time? But it was just a great experience yeah. that, that, that we had. I mean, it was a proper Thornbridge experience that, that, that we got yesterday. Yeah. And I think I come away with a real fondness for that brewery now, you know, 
after getting an experience like that. Oh, so. absolutely. Yeah, they, they really know how how to to look after mm. people, and and like I say, I mean, we've come away with some pretty special beers as well. Yeah. That uh, a, a few of which are no longer in production, so um, they'll be going into the to the cellar for maybe another couple of years yeah. just to just to relax and settle down a little bit. But um, so yeah, any other real standouts for for you? Um. <laughs> Just the the whole the whole thing was was a standout. It's difficult to pick out any particular part of it, isn't it? It is, yeah, <clears throat> um, yeah. So so special, like I say, the whole experience. So. And um, I suppose just to again just thank Simon for first of all for putting up the uh, the, the lot for the auction on on Big Beery Night last year. Um, but thanks also to he basically took the entire afternoon. To, to spend with us and to show us around and to show us the things that you don't get to see on the public tour. So really, really grateful to Simon, really, really grateful to, to Formbridge for the experience. Yeah.